How's it going, Justin? Good. Good. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm glad that y'all are here today. Uh, may I get a volunteer who will uh, run the microphone around the room so that those who are watching online can hear us as well? Who would be willing to do that for us, pretty please? Thank you, Cliff. I appreciate that. This microphone is not on yet, so you'll, if you'll turn it on when it's time, that would be great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So as we start, uh, some of y'all were here last week, and we're doing one of my favorite things. One of my favorite things to do is to think and talk about how to read the Bible. I like to read the Bible, but I like even more talking about how do we read it, um, because I think that's a more difficult question than we give it credit for. And a lot of times we grew up in churches that talk a lot about reading the Bible, but don't really give us the tools to know how to read the Bible. Um, and so I really enjoy this topic, and I'm glad that we are doing it. But let's start today with a prayer. Uh, there are handouts available by the coffee pot if you would like one. Um, but the same thing on the screen is on the handout. So let's read that opening prayer as we begin together. O oh God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your Spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So last week we talked about Balaam and the talking donkey, his talking donkey. Um, this week we're going to talk about Jonah and the whale or fish, the story of Jonah and if it feels a little like we're talking about the kind of stories that we teach children, we are, that's on purpose. Um, those are the stories that are so good we have to tell them to our children, but they're often the same stories that require us to approach them more like children than like kind of that, that adult that we want to be in church. Uh, sometimes God calls us to receive the reign of God, the majesty of God, like children, and reading stories like this is a good example of it. I will warn you that for the next few weeks after this week, we're going to talk about at least two stories that are not stories we would often teach our children, and yet I think if we approach them with that childlike wonder, they will, there will be more value in them. So next week, we're going to look at the cursing of the fig tree. The Exodus story is one that I think we would teach our children, and then the wrestling match of Jacob and the angel probably doesn't get a lot of play in Sunday school, but that's where we are and that's where we're headed. Um, so let me start just with a general question. How many of you on a, on a scale, think about um, how familiar are you with the story of Jonah, right? How familiar are with the story of Jonah? I'm going to give you a scale of one to five, one to five, and I want you to pick a number in your mind. You, uh, there will not be a test, so you can lie to all of us. Nobody will ask you about it. So one means I recognize that name, but I don't know anything more about it. Five means I know that story well, I read it recently, and I could tell you a little bit about not only the story, but how it gets interpreted and how it gets taught. And in between are the twos, the threes, and the fours of varying degrees. So one is hardly anything, five is I'm going to call myself an expert, and then the ones in between. I want us to raise our hands, and let's just see, uh, anybody in the room think of themselves as a five on the Jonah story? Boldly, boldly, raise your hand. No. 
How about four? Pretty knowledgeable. Yeah, a good number of fours. Threes? Yep, good number of threes. Twos? And a couple of ones maybe? Some ones? Yeah, great, great. Well, I love, I love that we span uh, that whole spectrum. But I also love that we're, we're, we've got something to say about the story. We know this story. Um, let me give you one other word of caution. Um, Jonah is a story that is kind of hard to break down into smaller pieces. Um, it doesn't come up in the lectionary very often. And one of the reasons is that to read a part of the story is to kind of miss it. You, you kind of got to read the whole thing. And we're going to read almost the whole thing, the whole book of the Bible. We're going to leave out a couple of verses, but we're going to read a lot of the story and I hope that by hearing the whole story, we might discover some new ways to think about it. So I've got it split up. I've given you a handout. Uh, would somebody read for us, please, whether from your screen, the, the screen or from the handout, would somebody read for us, please, Jonah chapter 1. It's a bit of text. Um, Tarshish, uh, Amittai, or whatever you would say. Um, who would read Jonah chapter 1 for us, please, using the microphone that Cliff, thank you, Adam. Um, Cliff's going to give you that microphone for you to read. Thank you. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came to him and said, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come to us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country and, and of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he said. He replied, I worship the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and nights. Thank you. All right, sounding familiar? Yep, yep. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask when I read a familiar story is to ask, what, what did you not remember? What surprised you? Are there any details in that first chapter that you think, I didn't remember it that way at first, but yeah, that makes sense. Any surprising details? Yeah. Raise your hand really high. Cliff, we need that microphone. Where's the microphone? Yep, thank you. For some reason, I thought Jonah had been more valiant in uh, sacrificing himself to the sea. Yeah. Yeah, more valiant. Yeah, yeah, thank you. What else, do you, what else did you, surprised you, perhaps? Or what caught your attention? What's interesting about the story? Where, where does your energy fall? Where does your attention fall? Yeah, Adam. I didn't realize that they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. I just thought that he admitted it, you know, 
outright. Yeah. But no, they were like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Yeah. I guess it's your fault. Yeah, thank you. What else? What else seems interesting to you? What else seems interesting? Yeah, Bill. Oh, uh, Jonah is not scared. Yeah, that he's not scared to be thrown overboard. Yeah, which tells you something about where he is in his, his, his emotional state. Not, probably not a great place. I don't think that's a peaceful thing. I think he kind of accepts death. Um, almost, almost suicidal, it feels, right? Yeah, yeah. What else do you notice? Yeah, Sally or, or uh, Haley, yep. Everyone's praying to different gods to see which one will respond. Yes, that's an important part of the story, isn't it? Right, yeah, and Sally? I didn't realize Jonah was asleep in the ship. Yeah. And it reminded me of that parallel with Jesus Isn't being that asleep. Isn't that funny? Yeah. What are you doing asleep? Don't you care that we're about to die? Pray, pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder how much the gospel narrative was thinking of Jonah when they told that. I wonder. Yeah, right. You know, um, all right. So I've, I've asked two questions on your handout. Um, do you know, what do you know about Nineveh? Especially those of y'all who were four. I know this story. What do you remember about Nineveh? Who are the Ninevites? Where are they? Where, where, anybody know anything about Nineveh? Yeah, yep. Yeah, Richard's up here. Richard knows about Nineveh. And I'm going to ask you about Tarshish, but I'll warn you that's a trick question. Yes, Richard? Nineveh's in uh, Mesopotamia, I guess Babylon, and maybe even uh, Assyria, depending yeah. on how the well, who's in yep. charge and where the boundaries are at that time. Yes, but you know it's not an Israelite city, right? That's, that's the important detail. Um, kind of like if I started talking about Tulsa, I bet there's not a single person in this room that needs me to remind them that Tulsa is not in Arkansas. It's not, it's not that far away, but like I can talk about Tulsa and we all know not Arkansas. You don't even have to think about it, right? It's, it's, it's over there. For the readers of this story, everybody would have known Nineveh is not an Israelite city. This is not uh, a, a place where God's people called home. Yeah, yeah, it's an Assyrian city um, on the Tigris River, um, the, uh, the capital of the Assyrian city, a, a pretty prominent place. Um, uh, Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire north of Israel, um, what we call Israel, the, the, the sort of the, the, the land of Canaan, and kind of a, a constant battle, um, you know, like, uh, Hatfield and McCoys imply like some, I don't know, some familial ties. It's more, it's more ethnic than it is familial. Um, but like, you know, the, 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 the Israelites and the Assyrians have been warring with each other um, and kind of uh, taking each other's territory back and forth. And the Assyrians, which uh, Nineveh is the capital of this empire, the Assyrians are continuing to kind of attack northern Israelite villages to raid them, to steal the women and the children, to kill the men, to burn their fields. This constant guerrilla, maybe even terrorist uh, uh, approach. This kind of, we, we want to scare the Dickens out of these northern Israelites so that they will give up. And so there's this constant, there's this constant battle between them. And that's the group to which God tells Jonah to go and announce judgment. So just let that tumble around. We'll come back to it. Um, Tarshish, anybody know anything about Tarshish? Tarshish, it's kind of a made-up place. I mean, it probably wasn't a made-up place, but it symbolized a made-up place. When I was a kid, my family used to go up to the mountains in western North Carolina, and we often stayed in a cabin, because it was convenient for our family, called Xanadu, um, one of those sort of mythical kind of places. It wasn't that great. Um, uh, uh, but, but, um, but it's kind of like one of those, it's, it's a faraway place. The word, at its, uh, etymologically, it means melting like smelting pot, like so, um, not culturally, but like metallically. So the, the, the wealth of Solomon is said to have come from the Isles of Tarshish, um, uh, sort of a, almost a mythical place. But the point is, it is not in the right direction, it's the wrong direction. And I think the language that we see in verse, right at the beginning of verse 3, Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish, but not just to Tarshish, but from God's presence. I think that's a significant place. So, so wherever this mythical place is, Jonah's thinking that it might be beyond the border of where God is to be found. Like he's, he's trying to run away from God in that way. So that's a, a bit of the story. Um, thoughts about that so far? 
And then let me, let me approach that second question. Um, casting of lots, how does that work? How do you think, like casting of lots, how does it work? I mean, I know mechanically, um, draw straws or throw dice or, you know, there are lots of ways to cast lots, but like, how does that work? Just, just think about that. I, you know, it's, I, it seems to work. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, the, the Bible uses casting lots a lot to determine what is right or a particular decision or who is chosen. Um, in this case, Jonah, the lots fall to Jonah. I just think it's an interesting kind of detail that we sort of often skip over. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just a curiosity to me, but it just all of a sudden made me think of people using crystals to make decisions. Yeah. The energy yeah. of some kind of energy that yeah. we don't understand exactly, but we, and I say we loosely, trust. Yeah, thank you. Like, I think the Bible would say to us that the magic eight ball is not a great way to make decisions unless it's God's magic eight ball, in which case maybe, right? Um yeah, but it, I think it's just fascinating. Um, I, I think the church should make more decisions by lot. I'm serious. I'm serious. Not because we think it's magic, but, but like to teach us to trust that whatever direction we choose, God's going to be there. Like, it's going to be all right. Like, our, our job is not to try to imagine that, just to kind of trust that what will come out of it will be good and holy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trent. <laughs> yeah, hearing you talk about it, it's kind of like the Yogi Berra quote. If you come to a fork in the road, take it. Take it. That's exactly right. I like that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, right up here, up front. Cliff, right up here, up front. Right up front, up front. Yeah, thank you. I think the imagery is really interesting. Think about them being on a, probably a relatively small boat. Yeah. A lot of people. Yep. And then they say, let's cast a lot. Mm -hmm. Let's grab straws and let's see who gets the short straw. Yeah. Or, I mean, it's just kind of a funny and an interesting thought. Yeah. I think, yeah, and the thought reflects a, 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 an assumed way of being that there are spiritual forces at work, right? This is not just a storm. There's some force at work here. And if, if, if the spirit world affects us in this way, then the spirit world can help us figure out whose fault it is, and then we can get rid of him, and then we can fix the problem, right? You know, yeah, yeah, right behind you, Haley, yeah. Um, where's the line between drawing straws or uh, lots and witchcraft? I think it depends on which god you're praying to, oh. is the short answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's more, it's more complicated than that, but that's, that's, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the way in the back, Dean, all the way in the back. Uh, interesting that they took responsibility. They thought it had to be somebody on the boat's fault. Yeah. Yeah, and what does that say about the human psyche, right? What does that say about us, right? You know, what did I do wrong? Um, this cancer diagnosis, what did I do wrong, right? Sometimes it doesn't work that way, but again, the, read this story as a child, right? Um, anyway, all right, so let's push ahead, and I've, I've cut out most of the prayer um, but let's pick back up with Jonah 2, and we're going to read a couple of verses, bookending that psalm, that prayer, and then we're going to read a chapter 3. Who might read this next section for us? Thank you, James, all the way up front. Raise your hand high so Cliff can see it. Thank you. All right, Jonah, chapter 2. You'll need to hold it really close to your mouth. Thank you. All right, all right Jonah, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Shao I cried, and you heard my voice. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pray. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Navna, that great city, and proclaim it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nav 
now Nevah, according to the word of the Lord. Now, now Nevah was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, as he cried out, Forty days more, and Navina shall be overthrown. And the people of Navina believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Navina, he rose from the throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Navina by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, they shall not drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with that cross, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Thank you. Those of y'all who are familiar with the story can already see sort of where this is going. Um, uh, Nineveh does exactly what God, I presume, wanted them to do, and yet perhaps what Jonah didn't want them to do, and that'll come to a collision in the next bit. But what do you notice? Like, what's as the story is told? Think about the way the story is told. What's being told to us? Not just the words, but what's what's being conveyed to us, Richard? The thing that stands out the most to me—that's really the most astounding—is though he is called a king of Nineveh, he's actually a warlord. And to to have that kind of power, you had to be really bloodthirsty and. So what Jonah would have expected when he was told initially to go to Nineveh is that they would take him and torture him until they got tired of it, and then they would just kill him. Instead, the warlord of Nineveh, the king, who probably worshipped Marduk as his chief god, heard the Hebrew god, was angry with him, and said, What? I'm in trouble with the Hebrew god. We better get on this. I mean, that, that to me is just really wow. Yeah, thank you. What else? Adam at the middle table? Dang. There's two parts, like two main parts in the story where people just immediately like, like believe in Jonah's God. Like, oh my gosh, wow. Like, and the, the, you know, it's funny, the sailors get increasingly more and more afraid of this God. Like, then they feared him even more. But um, <clears throat> also Jonah, like, in the context of the Nineveh being like a war camp, um, you know, he, he shows up and he's been in the, he probably does not have good news at all, nothing good to say at all. He's been through this or, ordeal and maybe they've seen, they see him and they're like, what would the point of torturing this guy be? He's obviously doesn't care. Like, you know, like he's been through this whole thing and he, he just, yeah. And uh, he probably looks like a, a messenger of death that he, the, they just believe him. They're like, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he he would he had been. I mean, we don't know how much time had passed, but he had been he had been vomited onto the seashore by a fish. Yeah. Um, probably didn't look like the kind of person you wanted to invite in for dinner, right? Yeah, right behind you, Cliff, Mandy. Always found it interesting that with God in control, doing all of this to make sure Jonah got to Nineveh. The belly of the fish, when he put him out on dry land, he could have easily had him land in Nineveh. Uh-huh. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So I just find it interesting that part of this story that's not told, like what you, I guess what you had asked, was that um, it's, sometimes it's about the journey. So it's important for Jonah yeah. to be on this journey to Nineveh. Yeah, thank you. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jonah has to, um, yeah, he has to walk. I mean, he's got, he's, he's, he's got to make a decision to go, right? Uh, I mean, presumably, if he had rejected it a, a, a second time, God would have found him and, you know, done something else, right? But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What else? What else is interesting to you in this part? It's a great story. Jonathan, in the back, thank you. God changes God's mind. Yeah, isn't that interesting? 
Do you, what, I mean, this, the second question on the handout, like, what do we mean by that? Like, what, when we say that God changed God's mind, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to us? Like, what, what are we actually saying? I don't know how often you think about that, but when, given all that we say about God, who God is, what God knows, what God does, um, all the things that we say and believe and sort of hold on to, whether it's well-founded or just kind of what we can wrap our minds around, what does it mean for us to say God changed God's mind? Why, why do you write it that way, right? What is that, what is that trying to tell us? What, what, what emotionally, uh, theologically, yeah. Yeah, think about that. That's, it's not easy. To me, it means that God's in control, not me. Yeah. Huh. That, I mean, that's what it means. I, it also, um, in his being in control, I can put forth my desires. Yeah. But he's the one that ultimately decides. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cliff? Interestingly enough, I think uh, they cast lots and... They want to see if this God is going to hold up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Is he real? Yeah. So what about the changing of the mind? What else does the changing of the mind tell us? What does it mean when we say God changed his mind? Like, think about that. Like, think about if your grandchild or child came up to you and said, um, I thought something was going to happen. And you say to them, I guess God changed God's mind. Like, think about what you're trying to convey. Like, that's a pretty bold statement for you to make and also to make about God. What? Sit with that for, yeah, yeah, Haley, yeah. Well, um, God has the right to change God's mind, yeah. but also uh, maybe they didn't understand the will of God in the first place. Yeah, 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 yes, absolutely. And I think, I think that's, I mean, that's the way I make sense of it. It's sort of a, a lack of understanding becomes understanding. But I think even more than that, it's what we knew, what we thought we knew to be true about God isn't, isn't right. Like we knew that God was going to wipe Nineveh off the face of the earth. Like God was coming to get them. Um, and then God does it. And that's, that's hard to get our mind around. Yeah, Pat, up here in the front. Just recently, I ran across something a Hebrew scholar suggesting that we think of God as interactive in reading the Old Testament, that we can cause a different outcome because of what we do, that God doesn't necessarily act alone. Yeah. And I huh. like that idea. It's a much more exciting way to think of scripture. Yeah, thank so. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That, that sense of partnership. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's an amazing story. I want to say one thing about the connection between the, the prayer, the psalm, and what happens, like, notice, notice the language of the prayer, right? We, I've, only, I've given you only part of it, but notice, like, notice verse 8, verse 9, verse, 7, 8, 9. Just, you know, um, Jonah, as the story is told, Jonah in the belly of the fish that the Lord caused to swallow him. Like, Jonah's prayer is still about kind of what does it mean to remember and you'll see in small caps, the Lord, Yahweh, Israel's God. Um, there's that bit about those who worship vain idols, forsake their true loyalty. You know, like there's this, like if you look at those words, it, you know, um, despite his running away from God, um, this is a chance for Jonah to remember who God is um, and how God works, um, to, to distinguish his faithfulness from the faithfulness of others, um, presumably those to whom he's going to go. In, in Nineveh, and the, the, the story is bringing, at least bringing to my mind and to my heart, that tension between, I guess, kind of what we see in verse, uh, verse 8. Uh, Those who worship vain, vain idols forsake their true loyalty. What a, what a curious way to describe what it means to chase after false gods. And I think there's a, a wonderful thread. It's not the, maybe it's not the most exciting thread, but there's a thread that we've already named about sort of the, everybody on the ship is praying to their own gods, and yet they kind of uh, then pray to Israel's God, and here we see uh, Jonah sort of reflecting the distinction between who God is, and now we see that same God changing God's mind. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's a it's sort of, it's, it's pregnant with um, discovery, discovery about who God is and how God works. Let's read the end of the story, 
Um, and uh, this is the part that actually does show up in the lectionary. Um, who would read for us Jonah chapter 4? Who would read that bit for us? Pretty please. I know someone will. Thank you. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He pre prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That that is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would come of the city, become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, is it, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also so many animals? Thank you. The end. I love that ending. I love the animals, the ending. It's just, it just feels so, it feels so unfinished. Like, what is Jonah going to say now? What are, what are we going to say now? It invites me into the story, right? Yeah, yeah. Imagine, I love, I mean, I, I return to this over and over again. Imagine that you're the director of this movie and that this is the last line in the script. Like, what's, what's that shot look like? Like, you know, what, 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 um, what, you know, what Kubrick elements, what, you know, like, what, like, like you know, just this great, um, what a weird way to finish, and it's finished. Uh, all right, so what do you notice? What's going on? What, what do you hold on to? What do you celebrate? What, do you, what frustrates you? What excites you about the story? What, what's going on? Trent? Hmm. Well, it reminds me of two things. It, it reminds me a little bit of the uh, prodigal son and the older brother. Uh, his attitude yeah. reminds me of the older brother. <clears throat> it also reminds me of Les Miserables and Jean Valjean and the police officer who's chasing him down. And when he comes face to face with justice versus mercy, he, he just can't deal with it and chooses to take his life. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me, Jonah kind of yeah. reminds me of that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What else do you notice? What else is, where's the energy for you? Yeah. Like, um, since earlier this hour, I've been thinking about, like, this, what, what's the culture of Nineveh, right? And what, how does Jonah feel about them? And he's, like, immediately, like, oh, clearly not. And he's, like, I'm going to go to the other side of the world so I don't have to go to Nineveh. And um, and God at the end says they don't know their right hand from their left. Like, and, and then this thing from the prayer about um, those who worship false idols forsake their true loyalty as if, I don't know if, if you're thinking this, but like God, our true loyalty is to like what is light in the world, and so that would be to God, right? Like, if, you know, everyone kind of maybe is imbued with that at birth, some, mm -hmm. you know, part of them. And anyways, um, it's got me thinking about how the king is immediately like everyone in this town, like he's not saying like, you will be sad. He's saying, hey, we all know what is going on here. Like, and we, it's, it, Time for justice. I guess we all have to die for it now. Like, we had fun, but shoot. And uh, maybe God will change his mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think... I hear 
the text, the story, asking us first to remember that there is only one God. That's a, a fundamental theological truth that, that the Bible, certainly at this uh, point of, its, of its, uh, the storytelling, uh, holds dear. There's only one God. I think the surprising thing is then, what is, if, if we believe that, and if we really believe that, then what does that mean about the Ninevites' relationship to the deity? Right? I, I think it's a really challenging thing for us, people of faith, to accept that if we really believe that there's only one God, then um, who are we to say that God doesn't love people who don't recognize that, right? You know, what, what does it mean to sort of really lean into one God of us all, not just the people who, who claim that God for their own, right? I think there's a great tension. And all the way through the text, we've got Lord, we've got God. We've got Lord, we've got God. Only on the ship did they begin to confuse Lord and God. The, 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 the non-Israelites use the term Lord. Uh, and here at the very end, we've got the narrator saying the Lord God, as if to say they're together. Um, yeah. Where are we? Yeah. Um, so I'm just saying from the beginning that Jonah's just totally misconstruing what, what God's trying to say. And then God, as you said, with a thud, and I say it, it's like a slap in the face. It's like, bam, bam, you're not getting this. And yeah. this is what it, it is. And then it's just, there's a finality to it that it's, you can't question me you know, type of thing. Uh -huh. There is yeah. no question about what I'm trying to say. You're just not getting it right. Yeah, yeah, just the way that, I mean, yes, yes, and that God's going to get through to you, right, yeah. I mean, you know, um, in, in discernment conversations, I often, you know, remind people that God, if God's calling you to do something, God's going to keep after you until you respond or die, right, I mean, right, um, yeah, 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 James. Hey, Evan, so um, these two questions on here, I kind of have a little bit for both of them. Um, I noticed here that, uh, what kind of story is this? If you look at the multi-layered story, it's not just about the prophet or Jonah himself. It's also about, like, how a foreign city treated God and that message hmm. as well. Because you have the city, you have the message of the city, like, just purely respecting God's wishes. But then you have Jonah, on the other hand, who is running from God, doesn't want to do God's desires, and then his own internal battles with God yet also God's power over more than just the Israelites, but also other, over other cultures, where they just simply bowed down and did what he wished. And it's basically on to say so, one guy that just literally went to a city of 100,000 people. And to me, that was very amazing. Yeah. Um, but I also think that God was trying to t uh, teach Jonah that you know, anything's possible with God's help. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and, and, and I would take that one step further and say, Anything is possible with God's help, um, and um, and and uh, yeah, and the, and and that God offers that to to all. That God's reaching out to all. Yeah. Um, yes. Other thoughts. Other reflections. Before I yeah, Adam and yeah yeah yeah. This is open ended. What um, it says in verse five. Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. What, what do we think that might be, a booth? Uh, you know, he found a blanket and tied it up against two branches and sat in the shade, I guess. I mean, a, a, a dwelling, a tent, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to watch, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about the uh, ending, the 120,000 people and animals and many animals. Uh-huh. And I think God is kind of pointing to their innocence. And, and they're not innocent of wrong, of evil necessarily, yeah. but they're innocent of who he is. Yeah. And Jonah was, the, was his messenger. And so when he spoke to them, the king's yeah. ears were opened and he was kind of enlightened. And that ending, again, is just emphasizing the innocence of people until they know the truth. Yeah, which is to say, um, it's really easy to hate those people over there when we don't know them as people. Um, and but but why would why would we expect them to uh, be any different if we haven't sort of helped them see who we are? Right? I mean, there's yeah, just the, the absence of knowing is um, yeah. I, I think maybe the implication is. And I like that. I do think there's a reason that they get lumped together, left hand from the right people and animals. Um, I don't think it means to dehumanize them, but 
the, the gift that is God's relationship with God's people is to be a light to the world. And if we're not willing to share that light, speaking on behalf of, 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 of Israel, if we're not willing to share that light with our so-called enemies, then why would we expect them to, to get it, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. I'm curious what you would say about, so the people hearing this story, I think maybe would have had Sodom and Gomorrah in mind. So God's call and then the response to what am I going to do to these people? Well, if there's only 100, well, if there's only 10, would you save the city? Versus yeah. you're going to save yeah. the city? Sure. It, they, surely the, the readers would have had that in their minds when they heard this. Yes. Do you think? Yes. Sure, I think there's a dialogue. Yeah, thank you for helping us hear that. Yeah, I think there's a conversation between that story from Genesis and this story in Jonah. Yeah. Um, let me point out a couple of things, and then we're going to move to the, the last questions and wrap up. Uh, this first sentence in chapter 4, this was very displeasing to Jonah. Literally, this became very evil to Jonah. Um, evil being the same word, right, that we see when... Um, they return from their evil ways, right? So there's, there's actually a, 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 a verbal linguistic link between the evil that the Ninevites are supposedly, apparently leaving behind, and that Jonah now calls that thing evil, right? You know, um, what does it mean for us to withhold God's love and forgiveness for, from someone because the thought of them being forgiven and loved is too much for us to bear, Right? Um, Jonah wants to die because he doesn't want to live in a world in which the Ninevites get forgiven. And how often have we felt, maybe proverbially, maybe literally, how often have we thought, I don't want to live in a world where those people get forgiven, get to go to heaven, get to belong, get name it, right? That's a, that's a fundamental human like instinct, you know, when those people over there, right? Um, and, and Jonah at the end, like he's furious. He is furious that God would do exactly what he knew God would do, uh, which is be merciful and forgiving. Um, that's not the way it's supposed to go, he says. And God's question to him is, you know, what, what do you, why are you upset about this, right? Why, uh, it, uh, calling us to, to know the to know the Ninevites, and it's not just the Ninevites, of course, but to know other people in a new way. Yeah. Here it comes. Brings to mind that there almost seems to be a, a feeling of jealousy there, not just anger, but jealousy. Sure. Yes. Yeah, I think resentment for sure. Jealousy. I mean, I, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to hold on to that. Um, yeah. Uh, the... Prophets, Jonah is a prophet from near Nazareth, up in Galilee. Um, prophets show up to warn God's people, and it's always God's people, to warn God's people that if they don't change their ways, bad things are going to happen. Right? So it's a call to repentance. Um, what's unusual is that God's sending Jonah the prophet to Nineveh, and, and at the beginning of the story, I think we might assume what Richard uh, brings us to, which is that Jonah's worried he's going to get killed. Because he, who wants to go to Nineveh and say, God's going to get you? Like, what, what do you, I mean, we, we have no time for that. The Ninevites certainly didn't have time for that. But then at the end of the story, to the surprise perhaps of the reader, as we get drawn into the story itself, um, uh, it, Jonah's reluctance is not about his own life. His reluctance is, dang it, God, why do you have to love them too? Uh, which is a hard, which is a hard thing, I think, for us to hear. Um, how many of us grew up hearing the story of Jonah as a tale that we are supposed to do what God tells us to do. Like, be faithful to God, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's not what this story's about. I mean, it is kind of, sort of. I mean, Jonah needs to do that, but I think if it is about that, you, you can't say that without also saying, do what God tells you to do, which is to tell people that God loves them no matter who they are, right? I mean, because the story is about God's ability to love and include even our worst enemies. That's the rub, right? That's the, that's the turn. It's not about if you're disobedient to God, you'll be thrown overboard, right? It is not if you don't do what God's going to be after you until, until God gets you, right? The way that I would use that in a discernment call. That's, that's not the point of the story. It's a part of the story. It's not the point of the story. The point of the story is harder than that. The point of the story is more challenging to me than that. So let me ask you those questions at the end. 
um, as we think about this. Like, so what happens? Like, if you read it, if you read the story as if there was a guy named Jonah and they cast lots and he got thrown overboard and a fish, whale, who knows, um, megalodon, who knows, like uh, comes and swallows him up. He's inside, think Pinocchio, inside the belly of the whale for three days, offers this prayer, gets vomited out onto the seashore, goes to end of a three-day journey. While he's walking, even the sheep and the goats get sackcloth. God changes his mind. Uh, Booth, bush, worm, ta-da. If you read it as if that were just literal history, what does that do to the story? Can, can we, does it have, what's its value? And, and what, what value does it lose? What happens to the relevance of the story if we just read it as an interesting story about a guy named Jonah and a remarkable thing? What, what do you think? Yeah? Yeah, Trent. It becomes an artifact. It becomes an artifact. Yeah. An artifact with maybe some implications. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't... Like, I, I think if, 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 if I read this story just so that you can learn about there was this guy named Jonah and we don't allow it to teach us something, that it just seems kind of stale. Um, you know, there's a reason we learn those things in history. It's not so that at dinner parties we know what happened in 1789, right? It's, it's so we can see sort of how all the pieces fit together. What are the, what are the movements and the motives and what's unfolding, right? Um, so, but yes, Mandy, in the back, yep. Thank you. I just see so much of this story is also so much about the journey of Jonah and it's God's presence with Jonah and that Jonah's listening to God. It is, I think when Jonah is upset on the hill and he's so mad at God, God's reaction to Jonah being mad at God is yes. that God plants that bush and it gives yes. him coverage. And that is such a strong message to us yeah. and our relationship with God. And then again, the journey's not over because then the bush goes away. So you can't sit there, Jonah. Yeah. You got to get up. It's about continuing to move. Uh, it's about continuing on with your journey. I think it's so much about Jonah's journey. Yeah, I, I really. In our journey with God. Yeah, and I think it, to some extent, reading it literally uh, as historical fact might help us identify with the way this person Jonah felt. Um, the um, when uh, this this part, his his prayer, and this part here, right? Um, like Jonah seems to be saying things out loud that he wouldn't normally need to say out loud. I knew that you were a gracious God, right? Why is he rehearsing for God what he thought, right? Well, I think it's to bring us in so that we can identify with those emotions. We get a, a, a wide range of sort of Jonah and Jonah's experience. And I, th I think it is to draw us in that way, not just to mythologize it. Yeah, yeah. But what happens to the story if it... And I think Jonah and, the, Jonah and the whale is a pretty easy story to read as a fable, right? It's pretty easy to read this as a, we're supposed to learn something from it. Does the story lose any power if your child, your grandchild says to you, was there really a guy named Jonah? And you say, probably not, uh, but it's an important story for us to read and learn something. Does, does anything happen to the story? Does the story lose its, its umph if it's just a, a moralistic tale? A shocking one, a, 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 a challenging one. Does it lose anything? Yeah. I, f I feel less, excuse me, I feel less energy uh, in those questions this time than I did last week. And I, I anticipate even, uh, even I'll feel the, the tension there more so when we get to the Exodus story. Like what, what, what if the Exodus story is just a fable, right? Uh, uh, don't, don't tell me that, don't tell me that, right? Well, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered how, how Jesus would have heard the story? I mean, somebody brought it up, like, um, how would a, an ancient Israelite have heard this story? What would they have understood it to be? And, and how do you read that story? And do those need to be the same? Or, or might they be different? Um, I think there's great value in trying to hear a story as it was heard, but not only trying to hear a story as it was heard. Um, I think Jonah and the fish is one of those stories that the ancients would laugh at those who try to make the Bible purely literal. I, I don't think... I don't think this was ever just the structure, the nature of the story. I mean, if you read the whole thing, it's just funny. It's a funny story. It's supposed to be funny. Um, I don't think the ancients would have ever expected that an eyewitness could have recalled this story. I don't think it, it's presented from that perspective. And yet, 
something happens in the middle of the 19th century when we start to obsess over sort of the literal uh, historical truth of the Bible. And I think, I think the ancients would have laughed at us. I think there's value in that peculiar historical lens of reading scripture. But I think in this case, this story is, the story is bigger than the story of a man named Jonah and a, a, uh, a repentance of Nineveh. There's no, there's no archaeological record that the king of uh, the Assyrians repented of something and started worshiping Israel's God. That, that's not there. Um, I don't th- and I don't think anybody who read this in the ancient world would have said, I don't remember reading about that in the history books. I think they would have celebrated the challenge that this story presents uh, each of us. And if we, if we miss that, if we lock this in the past as an artifact, as Trent says, I think we've, 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 we've robbed it of its, of its real power. Yeah. Um, I'm glad y'all are here today. Uh, next week, the cursing of the fig tree, a New Testament text. Um, appreciate it, and I'll see y'all then. Thank you all.